Okay, you're up and running. All right. Um, first of all, first of all, I want to say that the um, March speaker sounds amazing. I've, I've just started a class this term. Um, on it's called spirituality of the earth, and a lot of the eco theology. Um, really ties in with pilgrimage really well, and I, I, I think it's just a really important area um, for all of us. Um, so good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dan, for inviting me and for that introduction, um, and for this invitation uh, to speak to you about pilgrimage and to share wine and tapas. Um, some of my favorite things are to talk about pilgrimage and drink wine, so I'm this very happy. Uh, so, I am Michael Drell. I'm, a, I'm in seminary nearby here in Berkeley at Church Divinity School of the Pacific, or CDSP, um, which is part of the uh, Graduate Theological Union, or GTU. Um, it's a big consortium of many schools. Um, so I have another year and a half to go in my course, and I welcome your prayers for my studies. It's not easy. Um, but first off, I'd like to conduct a quick survey uh, so I can get a better idea of like who we all are in relation to this topic. Um, so my first question, is, and just raise your hand. Um, raise your hand if you have ever made a pilgrimage before. Define wow. pilgrimage. Great question. Um, so for now, you, you can define things as you wish, and like we can talk more about the questions. Um, but I love interruptions, especially for clarification, um, because I, I'm someone that if I'm listening and I and I'm confused, it holds me up in moving forward. So so please ask questions at any time, especially for clarification. Um, so I won't define that just now. But what I'm saying is, if you think you've made a pilgrimage, raise your hand and keep that hand up if the pilgrimage was a multi-day journey. Um, anything more than a single day, including travel time, flights. All right. Um, second question. Raise your hand if you have encountered a labyrinth. And I've noticed there's actually one on the side. <laughs> Um, and I say encounter rather than walk for several reasons, um, which we can get into, but um, you may have uh, traced a handheld labyrinth with your finger. Um, people also use labyrinths just to trace with their eyes. Um, and accessibility is a, a big issue and something that the GTU pilgrimage project is very much uh, keen on developing. So, uh, number three, raise your hand if you have ever visited a cathedral or any church, or mosque, or synagogue, temple, great. Um, question four, raise your hand if you regularly attend worship services of any sort. And regular can be Christmas or Yom Kippur, once a year. I didn't say often, awesome. Okay, uh, number five, raise your hand if you have ever visited a cemetery or the tomb of somebody. And my last question is, raise your hand if you are a nurse, physiotherapist, or a hospitality worker. Thank you. Um, so you may have questions about these questions, and I'm happy to take those now, or we can wait. And things should circle around as far as our conversation, my conversation with Dan and our conversation together. Um, as I said before to, to this lady here, if you have clarification questions, whenever I'm speaking, Please ask them, put your hand up. If I don't see your hand, shout out. Um, uh, so church people and grad students often get into like vocabulary bubbles. And so like church graduate school is, a particular, is particularly prone to this. So please stop me if, if uh, you need clarification. So how did I get here? Um, there's a quick story to explain some context. Um, I was walking on Spain several. I was walking in Spain several years ago on pilgrimage, and I was planning to come to seminary. And I remember like uh, anxieties rising in my chest about graduate school and whether I would get in. And um, I also so so I was nervous, but I was keen. And so I prayed, and I also prayed that somehow I'd be able to study pilgrimage when I got to seminary. Um, and I didn't know how that might look. Um, but I was praying that, that this deeply important part of my faith and practice could be also part of my studies. Um, and so then a lot happened, and I arrived in Berkeley at the GTU, uh, where I find Dr. Catherine Baruch, who's a scholar and professor of art history and pilgrimage studies. 
So I encourage you to read her work and explore the Berkeley Art and Interreligious Interreligious Pilgrimage Project website, which Dan has already called up. Um, but that's pilgrimage.gtu.edu. Um, so I got to enroll in some of her classes and also undertake a special reading course under her supervision on the material culture of religion, which is a big part of pilgrimage. Art, architecture, icons, statues, um, all sorts of sociology stuff involved too. Um, so I feel extremely blessed and excited about my continued learning in this field. But I'm not here to teach you about pilgrimage. Um, hopefully we'll all learn from our time together. But I'm not an expert. Uh, it's more like I'm a passionate uh, student practitioner. And I hope to remain in that space for forever. Um, so as I see the purpose of me being here is really to just open up a conversation. Um, and one that hopefully can continue beyond this evening. Um, most important for my work in ministry is that I'm making an offer to support you in your making of pilgrimage. So I welcome your ongoing questions and ideas as you think and read about pilgrimage or as you plan and prepare to make pilgrimage, um, as you make the journeys themselves and as you reflect on them afterwards. Um, so I will say that although pilgrimage is personal and unique, it is never individual. Uh, my own pilgrimage is enriched by yours and all others. So we'll probably get to this a bit more later, um, but I wanted to begin by offering this support and my email address, which is mdrell, so M for Michael, D-R-E-L-L, -L, at ses.cbsp.edu. Um, I'm also on Instagram as mike.drell, and we could spend all evening debating social media. Um, <laughs> But uh, Instagram is undeniably a site where I found like a rich and growing pilgrimage community. Um, so Dan sent me a few preliminary questions ahead of this talk and I, I wanted to cover those to some degree before we all chat together. Um, the first question was, what does this practice have to offer? Uh, and my immediate response to this question is everything and nothing. Uh, by everything, I mean the pilgrimage is a way in which life itself can be framed. The way I see things, everyone is already a pilgrim, and there's several self-identified pilgrims here already. Um, but it's really about an awareness and intention. So this framing of life as pilgrimage is a way of deepening and enriching or beautifying, with a capital B, the journey of life you are already on. Art and creativity play a big role. Um, on pilgrimage, you may not find any answers as such, um, and I wouldn't, myself, I wouldn't suggest that approach of looking for answers, um, but I can assure you that you will receive both gifts and signs. Uh, these can be as literal or as metaphorical as is needed for your particular personality and the context of time and place in which you are located, um, but this is just one of my guarantees about pilgrimage. Another guarantee is that your senses will be engaged. Whether you're on a five minute walk from your car to a pew in church, or a multi-day journey along one of the iconic pilgrim paths in the world, um, you have a great opportunity to allow more embodied experience into your awareness. So when I cheekily say that pilgrimage offers nothing, I'm making a comment on the way that we hold on to expectations of acquisition, um, so planning what you are going to get ahead of an experience for me is vastly different from focusing more on opening up to receiving, receiving all sorts of blessings, insights, understandings, and connections. Uh, there's a, a larger anti-utility piece in, in all this, uh, theologically, which I'm happy to explore with you, but I won't harp on unless I've asked. <laughs> um, so question two, what are the basics? Uh, so what are we talking about when we talk about pilgrimage? Um, there's a lovely little book from Oxford University Press uh, called Pilgrimage, a very short introduction. And the author, Ian Reader, writes, In essence, pilgrimage incorporates three main elements. Travel and movement, veneration in some form, and a special place or places considered to have some deep significance, often associated with sacred figures or founders, and that makes them stand out from the world around them. I don't disagree. Sorry? Can you read that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
so it's Ian Reader. Um, in essence, pilgrimage incorporates three main elements, travel and movement, veneration in some form, and a special place or places considered to have some deep significance. What is veneration? Great question. Um, I, I can say that veneration for me would, in the Christian context, would be like a saint, venerating a saint, like a, a praying for their support, or admiring their story, or um, being interested in the example that they led in life, or there's, there's lots of ways to venerate. But it's something about like um, respect and um, holding up. Would it be wilderness? Great question. I, I, would, I would say yes, but you might want to, in that situation, um, specify it. Like you, you could venerate wilderness in general, but that might be a bit unfocused for a pilgrimage. There might be a tree yep. that you venerate, a specific old tree or young tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't agree with any, I don't disagree with any of that uh, definition, but I consider pilgrimage more simply to just be any journey that one makes with an intended destination the tree, um, and an intention to remain open to transformation or change as part of that journey. Um, so for, under my kind of simplified definition, we have intention or willingness, we have movement, uh, but not wandering, and we have direction. And maybe we can say that um, there's physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional aspects to, to all three of those. Um, and we also have openness and acceptance, and then we're off. So the final question before our uh, more conversational approach is this one. How has pilgrimage impacted your spiritual life? So uh, again, I would say everything and nothing, but uh, that's a bit of a joke. So in all seriousness, it's difficult for me to distinguish my spiritual life from my life overall. Um, there are certainly practices which further this interconnection and pilgrimage as a framing for life, as I mentioned earlier, is also very much functioning at a contextual level where time and geography and intention can be focused, like on a specific pilgrimage. So you can conceive of my life as a pilgrimage, but I can also make a contained period of life as a pilgrimage with specifics and plans. So the simple act of intention to make pilgrimage or relate a journey or experience to the pilgrimage practice and metaphors will strengthen whatever your own conceptualization of the term spiritual life is. But it is also possible to completely ignore this relationship and walk across Spain or throughout Japan visiting temples and remain staunchly a, a tourist. Um, for me this would be a struggle, but maybe for others it, it's the other way around. Um, so I'm happy to, yeah? Why not? So I'm not against wandering, but pilgrimage for me um, is that there is a destination chosen, and that may be related to veneration, that may be related to direction, um, but that contains the journey in a certain way, um, and I have plenty of stories of where that goes awry, and I'm not, it's not necessary that you ever necessarily get there, but it's part of the way that you create an intention and a path. Yeah. Would you give an example of a pilgrimage that is not one of the iconics? Uh, that, yeah, end of question. Sure. I'm, I can give many, but you repeat the question so people can. Oh, yeah, sorry for the tape. Um, this gentleman's asked for me to give an example of a pilgrimage that's not one of the iconic, well known ones. Um, so, Culturally, there are actually a lot of like iconic ones that aren't well known to us because of our because of we're in the West and like in Japan, there's famous pilgrimages in India. That, so there are some that are iconic but not well known in our context. Um, but you but any pilgrimage um, is possible uh, and maybe the first time it's ever done. Like you could create a pilgrimage that would not be known to anyone and or yourself until you've done it. So you could say, like an old tree, let's say in these woods here, um, you could decide that you wanted to intentionally make a pilgrimage to that tree and learn from that tree. Um, but there are, there's, there are thousands and thousands of 
ones that maybe used to be well known and aren't anymore. They fall, you know, they um, a lot of uh, pilgrimages emerged when other pilgrimages became too dangerous to undertake. Um, so the, the ebb and flow of it. I mean, you're often walking on paths that were pilgrim paths that we don't even know about anymore. There's a question over here. Yeah. Well, it, it really depends what you mean by qualitative. I think that there are a lot of parallels, and then there would be many, many differences related to What would be some differences be? I'm not a Muslim, um, but uh, I know, for instance, that the, like um, when you reach the destination, I forget how to say it, the Kaab, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Um, that there's like um, patterns of movement, for instance, around that. Um, I'm assuming that in a lot of contexts on Hajj, there would be a separation of genders um, and specific uh, activities um, in prayer, maybe. Um, what would be some others? I think you definitely have to be a Muslim to go at least uh, to touch the, the Kaab. Um, excuse my, def uh, my pronunciation. but. Um, most of the Christian pilgrimages that, that I know of are open to anyone, uh, including tourists or non-pilgrims in their own uh, assessment. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Oh, yes. It, it sounds like you know, an essential part of this setting of an intention and then setting out with that intention in mind. So there's some, it sounds like there's something about leaving your regular, busy, mindless sort of activity, <laughs> um, right? So you're setting yourself into mindfulness, but you're, and you're setting apart a maybe from your life, or I don't know, can you, can you speak about that? So the, the question yeah. is um, related to the intentionality yes. and how important it is, correct me as I go, but um, how important it is that there, that that intentionality involves like a removal from normal life or your, your regular yeah, patterns. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. So I would say maybe not necessarily. Ah. And I'll leave it at that for now because I think we'll come around to, to answering this in a few ways probably. Yeah, but ask me again if I haven't. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so let's take a pause here. So some good questions for Michael. And then I don't know how many questions I had for our Q&A. So I have a big long list of questions that I want to talk to him about, but that's just me. Uh, I'll get through some of those and then we'll leave some space for you all to keep asking questions. Um, and why don't we just take a quick little break and freshen up our drinks while I, we readjust up here and then we'll get into a kind of a Q and A time. Does that sound good? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, any questions before? Hi Trudy, I'm glad you came. Trudy and I have suffered with COVID, the identical COVID for three and a half weeks. We're both now out of the woods. So we're so glad to see you. She's happy, happy to see people. All right, take a little break, freshen up, and then we'll meet you back here uh, around the table. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I was missing was that. Oh, out of a cocoon. This is great. All right. Yeah, and feel free to bring some food up.